Welcome back to another episode of Autonomy Pods. It's a solo episode again, and uh, we are on the sofa this week. Uh, we just moved into a new apartment in Dubai, so we are testing out the sound. So apologies if it is a little bit different than last week's. Uh, we are just in a different place. Uh, so if the acoustics aren't particularly up to scratch, then my apologies, and probably you can hear the washing machine in the background as well. That's my bad. Uh, trying to be as time efficient as possible. But today we're going to speak about the probably the two to three depending on how far we get, the fundamentals in successful transformations. Now, there's two parts of a transformation that uh, will probably end up being multiple episodes. And if you know anything from the autonomy ones from previous, you'll know that we do really care about the longer term journey. But for now, we're just going to care about the specifics of the, the how to get fat loss, you know, how to get rid of your specific fat that you have in order for you to kind of consider even being in our lifestyle phase, consider even maintaining, because often this is the, the trap that people fall into is that they don't end up getting the results that they want in a fat loss phase. So they end up trying to get more off, even though they don't want to, with an unsustainable way and end up spinning their wheels with very low calorie weeks and then high, high, high weekends and end up getting nowhere with their results. So we're going to look at the successes and the secrets to uh, fundamentally getting your your fat loss in and getting it over and done with because we don't want it to be for a long time. We want to have it for a space of time and then for you to not have to do that ever again or for a while at least. There will always probably be parts of your years where you do spend a little bit cleaning up, quote unquote, from a dieting perspective. But we want to operate in a, in a realm of that. There should, no be, should no, not be any large scale 20, 25 kilo plus type of weight loss that's needed to happen ever, ever again. So the first fundamental for a success of a fat loss phase is creating a guideline of how you're going to do it and what you want to achieve. There isn't going to be a specific route or path that is going to be yes, 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 all the way. You're going to have stumbling blocks. You're going to have pitfalls. You're going to have uh, times and where you aren't going to do what you set out to do. And that's okay. You know, you are a human, which inevitably comes with a, an element of trial and improvement and not doing what we say that we're going to do and being quite contrary because that's the human condition but we by understanding ourselves and setting out a, a guide rope in front of us we are able to kind of stick to the path as best as possible having your expectations met by someone like a coach is really really important Often the, the, key, the key reason why people don't achieve their goals is that they set either too short expectations or too long. So they, if they expect two kilos or three kilos in a three month period, and then they achieve it within a two to three week period, and then they get complacent. And then they don't know what to do with the rest of their time. Don't know what next goal to set because people aren't used to hitting goals and used to attain, like chasing them and then falling by the wayside. Or you have the people, which is you know 70 to 80% of the people are going to set unrealistic expectations. They're expecting 20 kilos in five weeks. They're expecting to have all their problems solved within you know, a six week period or uh, to gain the confidence back that they lost you know, in, in, a, in a two week period just because the diet is more aggressive. And this really sets people up for failure and ultimately they don't get to the, the desired result because they have these unrealistic expect expectations. You know, it would, it's very much similar to how financial advisors work. You know, I have an, I had an unrealistic, when I first met my financial advisor, I had a really unrealistic target of being able to, you know, save a considerable amount of money per month or get to this financial wealth point of being able to get some property and, you know, do the usual ladder climbing that people will do when they have a little bit of financial income and stability. And I was rudely awakened by the, the level of expectations that, you know, I received from, effectively my coach, financial advisory coach. If I wouldn't have had them met, I wouldn't have been able to make realistic plans. If I wouldn't have been able to make realistic plans, I wouldn't have been able to put structure in place or day-to-day -day processes in place to get those desired results. Now, if you're expecting to earn a million pounds or save a million pounds, you really need to know how much you're going to be saving per day or how much are you going to be committing to per week or what does that look like from a sacrifice perspective? You know, what are you giving up to make that happen in the long term? And I think without that, from a dieting perspective, you're going to really come up short. You need to know at the beginning, you know, what is it that this entails? How long it entails for, perspectively? What do I have to give for that to get that back? 
And what am I giving up in the short term to be able to have that in the longer term? Once you can create that and you can get these bariatric metrics of this is what we need to do this week, next week, the week after that, and hold yourself to those facets, you'll, you'll put yourself in a better position to be able to go and then chase those. Because once clarity is made, you can then create structure process around clarity. Without clarity, there's ambiguity and that becomes uncertainty. And, and therefore, you, if you operate in the element of uncertainty, there's going to be an element of that and may never get done. There won't be consistency within that. So having your needs met from an expectation point of view is going to be absolutely critical. Once you have those, the world is your oyster to get going. After that, this most, uh, the second most important part of you know, a very successful diet is the word sacrifice. Now, it can be wrapped up in so many ways. It can be wrapped up in the pretty, uh, pretty words like investment and you know, growth for yourself or pushing in the direction to improve my self-worth or goal. But you can have it that way. And words are very, very powerful. But I'm going to call it sacrifice because it almost is. I, I come from a being a fat dude mentality. It almost is like giving up the good life. You give up the good life of the not caring about food. You give up the good life of not tracking calories. You give up the good life of eating a pack of biscuits, which inevitably made you happy at that moment in time, just probably not your waist. And, and then moving into this element of like the give and the take, the push and the pull, the up and the down. So when you're embarking on your, your fitness fat loss journey, you're going to need to take the rough with the smooth and be able to understand the role of sacrifice in the job that you have. Fat loss is not easy, um, especially doing it in a time frame that is uh, considerable, uh, seeing considerable results every single week and doing it in a way where you're not dieting for four, six, eight months at a time uh, and you're losing all you know, social entities in, in, the, in that time and you're doing it in a, in a meaningful time to be cost effective from either working with a coach or someone that you know, has guidance and then secondly, you're doing it in a time frame that you see these tangible results weekly so that you can get something from that mentally uh, and physically and upskill. So when you get this, what do I need to give up? It almost becomes a case of, okay, what am I willing to sacrifice on a week-to-week -week basis to get this end desired result? So I think it's important to go through what you actually have to, at some point, sacrifice to get you to the goals that you want. Now, the most important caveat to all of this is that what gets you down there isn't something that stays down there. So if I say, okay, you know, you have to track your calories more accurately, that's not something that you have to do once you're down there to sustain being down there. It is a modality that you can use, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be something that you have to use. So when you when we're looking at that being down and getting the results, keep keeping them off versus getting down there. I treat these as two separate entities and what, what, what gets you down there doesn't always or should keep you down there. You know, most family members would agree, you know, if they don't come from a health and fitness background or someone that has been exposed to this type of living is that they will think that they're, don't, they're not going to track for the rest of their lives after they've tracked food in their dieting phase, or they may not want to track their food with their family or have their kids see that they're measuring food or because they have this perception that it's, it's quote unquote bad which is fine. It's totally someone else's opinion and that's, that's okay. But you, in order for you to get more results on the fat loss phase, you have to be more accurate. And then when you're down there, you can make a decision of how loosely you want to track things over time. So you have to give up some form of liber liberal nature to food intake. There becomes more of a thought process around what am I eating? How am I eating it? How many calories does this have? You know, is this nutritious for me? How does it make me feel? They're all valuable subsets of what you'll need to be thinking about. Some people will feel like, feel like that's overwhelming because it's adding already to the noise that's in their head. Uh, and they will feel that like they don't want to, you know, embark on that type of thought process. But like with anything, when it's new, it's almost quite raw in your mind. It's almost something that you think about more often. It's, all, it's quite, you know, to the the, the forefront of your mind to think about so it, it does become something that you start questioning you know am i supposed to be having this is this beneficial for my goals 
is this going to get me fat loss or is this going to take me away from it? Like, there, it, how does this food feel? Like, there's always this new thought process around food intake as opposed to before. It was like, I just ate food for whatever I wanted and didn't have to think about it. There is a trade-off that you have to think about things a little bit more, at least until you become a bit more autonomous and a bit more automatic with your thought processes over time. You will at some point have to accept some, some part of hunger. Now, the way that you do your day and the way that you navigate your things like uh, meal timings or um, sleeping patterns or how much vegetables you utilize, they're all going to have a quintessential role in how hungry you are on a day-to-day basis and where your calories are at. But at the end of the day, there will be some level of hunger that you will have to tolerate to be in a calorie deficit. You can be more strategic and have more food volume and less meals over a, a short space of time, like skip breakfast and have more food in the evening. But there will come a point of where you will need to feel that energy loss from the calories that you're inevitably losing because you're trying to get your body to burn its own fat, which comes from you eating less and using its own subso- substrate to, feel, uh, to fuel yourself. So there will be that hunger levels. And those that try and move away from hunger, the ones that try and um, do at any cost to not have hunger will will ever, inevitably the ones that are constantly go over their calories on a week to week basis when they find things difficult. It's just something to accept and be part of parcel. I like personally to know and accept hunger within the mornings. So it's easy to accept it and say, okay, I'm going to have it at this time. If I have all my meals from 11 a.m. onwards, I know that I'm potentially going to be hungry between the hours of 7 and 11. That's totally normal. But when it comes to 11 and I've had that long-term gratification of like not eating for five hours, I can then eat more over a short space of time, which is going to feel me better and fuel me better for the rest of the day when it do find particularly that it's going to be a hard part of the day. So hunger is definitely some part of them. Now, depending on where you are in your journey, you may embark on some level of like energy loss or uh, sacrifice on like training lifts. You might be quite lucky if you've never trained before or you're, you're new to training that you will just inevitably go up and up and up with your lifts because you're new, you're getting a good response. You've probably not had this many consistent bouts of training or uh, protein intake. So you may just see a steady flow of weight training. But for some people, there will, will be potentially a drop in weights lifted because your body weight is coming down and your, um, your energy levels will be lower because the calorie intake that you're having is less. So that will just be part and parcel. And again, relative to how much sleep, meal timings, uh, calories you're on, um, all of those small variables that people say that don't matter too much, they will matter a lot when you get down into those minutiae of how much energy you have when you have to utilize it. But at some point in the day, you may feel lethargic and you may feel like that's not, um, that's not high energy per se. And then another thing that you probably want to think about when you're looking at sacrifice, which is an inevitable part, is going to be your ability to blend in to the crowd that you're in all of the time. Now, there's nothing stopping you from managing your calories or having a right great strategy to be able to fit into the social scenarios that you're around. But if I'm looking from my perspective as a coach or someone that used to be you know, an extra large and now sits at a, sits at a small, you can't always fit into the crowd that you're around because their habits will be a higher representation of something that you don't want to be as opposed to the new individual that you're trying to be. So if you are got friends that go out for an occasion with one or two drinks, that's fine. You don't need to worry about that. You can continue to just be have a better strategy. But if you've got friends and you, you hang around the crew of, you know, let's get Larry not ca- let's not care about the amount of calories that we, we eat or consume or we have 10 to 15 drinks on, on a night, you know, that that's going to always lead you into a situation where if you follow that crowd, there's going to be a really hard part of you struggling to stay within your calorie allowance during this dieting phase. So there's a, we're all for strategy and there's always something that you can do. But if your environment or the people that you're around are the ones that are OTT or they go completely massive. Like, you know, it took me five, maybe eight years to get to a point of where uh, I was able to reduce the amount of food that my mum and dad would make me 
uh, or the way, or the habits that they had around food eating. And, you know, my family, I always say to people that, you know, you know, I came from a family where my dad used to have dessert with every meal, including breakfast. That's the type of habits he has. And um, which is fine for him, but he, I'm not him. And also I want to be in better shape than where he is. So, you know, you can't always just do what the other people around you are doing. So there is an element of toing and throwing with that sacrifice of saying, okay, well, who am I around? What are, what are they going to do for this goal that I've got? Like, are they contributing to that or are they pushing it away? Or, or if I'm around these certain sort of people, I never really end up staying true to my calorie allowance. So, you know, those type of people are the people that you probably have to like, not sacrifice, but you have to put a strategy in place around those to kind of not blend in completely, not be the full chameleon of going 10, 15 drinks with them. You know, go the five, go the six that you can fit within your calories and then let them do their thing with the rest of it. And you just do your five to six, which you can, you know, argue and say that you're still going to get the same benefit apart from them having a hangover and getting shit faced and you're just like nice, loose and relaxed. So there's that, there's that element of sacrifice that probably does come from a social element. Most PTs will try and sell you the dream of say, and online trainers will try and sell you the dream of saying that you can, you don't have to sacrifice nothing to get in shape. It's fucking bollocks. These are the people that are not in shape themselves as online coaches and struggle with food because they don't realize that in order to get something that is truly great, you do have to sacrifice. You know, can't just, you know, if you're sitting in the mid ground and not in shape yourself and never been in shape yourself, how can you tell other people that, oh, you don't need to worry about not sacrificing or restricting just to sell a program. So be wary of the people that say that you don't need to sacrifice anything because ultimately if you're coming from a position of a hundred kilo person habits, you can't be a hundred kilo person habits at 60 kilos. You have to be a 60 kilo person habits and you have to manage them better than a hundred kilo dude. Otherwise you'll end up being back at hundred kilos. So you have to sacrifice something because sacrifice is the point of you gone too far on one end of the spectrum and you're tra- trying to pull it back into the other end. You don't want to not restrict because your restriction has en- led you to a position of where you are or you're wanting to change the body that you have. So restriction is absolutely fine and is necessary in the aid and the sacrifice is necessary in the aid of you changing who you want to be because you've gone some one end of the spectrum too far. So once you've looked at those sacrifices and you've understood that these are the parts and parcel of the role, so you've got hunger, energy levels, maybe potentially your social circle um, and how, how you act in that social circle. And then the last one is just the, the, the combination of the intensity of accuracy. Like the, you will be okay to lose three to five kilos. That three to five kilos, if I'm being completely honest for most people, it is really, really easy. Once you get a structure in place, a routine, uh, a, a, a desired goal, the expectations, they, they know what they're kind of going to sacrifice. They know where they're going to win. They know where they're going to kind of have to struggle and problem solve. And then, you know, when you're looking at that longer term fat loss, the people that have got five, 10, 15 kilos to lose, most people have 10 kilos to lose, even if they think that they haven't got any weight to lose um, because they think that they haven't got fat, but they have. Um, these are the people that will, and for the most part, will lots of people struggle with the the seven to 14 kilo range once you get past the 15 kilo range i think the hump has already been done so then you're already steaming towards it whereas if you're on the opposite end the zero to seven kilos i think you're super super motivated and you're really happy with the progress that you're making and you're still wanting more i feel like between seven and 14 kilos there comes an element of consistent uh, complacency it's a time frame of probably more than seven to eight weeks So uh, complacency slash uh, the same process of of routine that happens when you brush your teeth. You used to be able to be consistent, brush your teeth, you know, get the molars at the back and be able to really give you, when you first did it, you used to brush your teeth immaculately. Now you're probably thinking about 12 other different things while you're shoveling the toothbrush in your mouth. And some days you might not even know where where you're shoveling it. It's the same with food intake and the accuracy of round doing what it takes to continue the results on. You know, from the seven to seven to fourteen kilo range, people often hit that complacency. You've done it for two months. You don't want to do the accuracy of the eight nine months. You've, you're living off the fact that you've lost, lost seven already, and you've done it pretty well. Whereas now you've, you're dropping the ball a little bit, and you're focusing a little bit less. Over time, you focus less and less and less without that re without that reassessment, without that okay realignment. So you know the accuracy matters when you're doing a fat loss phase, and and 
again, people, uh, online coaches will, will tell you that, you know, accuracy doesn't matter. You know, you, you can, you can worry about, or it, it doesn't worry about your blueberries. It doesn't worry if you've had a handful of this, or you don't worry about if you had a handful of that. When in fact, like everything matters, it's dependent on the goal and the context. So if your goal is to be in a calorie deficit, you're going to want to know the accuracy level uh, and the higher accuracy that you do have, the better you can obtain those results in a consistent manner. You don't have to track, you don't have to be accurate all of the time, but that will change the inevitability of you getting results, which if it's, that's the primary focus, then why would you not be accurate? You know, it comes down to a case of just doing the same thing in day in, day out and being okay with consistency or slash people are mistaken boredom for consistency. Um, being a negative when actually if you look at any very very or even not even very just any successful six-figure business person or six-figure entrepreneur they've got a routine they've got a consistency and they do the same shit day in day out you know i've worked with P when i was a pt you work with these high profile ceos you work with these stock stock market guys and in eight figures you look you work with these guys that are entrepreneurs running business multiple businesses they're not doing special things they're doing the special thing is that they do the same thing every single day and day out and they apply effort and intensity to that specific thing. And a diet is a representation. That's why most entrepreneurs are, and, and arguably those high level uh, achieving performers are really good when you get them in shape and you, you give them a plan of action because they can be consistent because that's their superpower. They've learned that over time from their business and they learn that, you know, this is not boredom. The, this, is, this, this is what you do for the desired result. It's about the process, whereas maybe the lay individual who hasn't ever experienced consistency or boredom uh, in a way where then it's, it's meant achievement of things. They've only ever had boredom or consistency and then they've been bored of it and then they end up not doing it because they're, they're bored and unentertained and never seen a positive outcome in it. And they're obviously going to then do eight weeks and then be bored and unentertained. And therefore that's going to lead to inaccuracies because they're unentertained with something that is never meant to be entertaining anyway. Like you're not meant to be, you know, ugh, laughing and joking and entertained and fulfilled by your food intake. You're meant to be nourished and stopped from dying. Um, and that part of you is not meant to be all entertained every single day. And the most people that, that get that consistency will understand that consistency isn't exciting. Consistency is consistency, which is quite monotonous, but it gives you a desired result. And if the, 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 if the desired result is worth it enough, then you will do the consistent nature because you value the end result that comes. So once you're in that seven to 14 kilo range of inconsistencies, inaccuracies, and you are just not doing what you used to do, or you're not seeing where you're going to because you've been in that seven week, 10 week, 12 week duck, it's all about pushing through that and, um, and real, realizing that the consistency that you showed within week one to week seven is the thing that will get you through to week seven to week 14. I'll give you the 14, 15, 20 kilo drop, give you all of the wishes that you want from a physical perspective, all come through you showing up daily and doing the boring or unexciting uh, as best as you can to the best of your abilities. So hopefully you enjoyed that uh, next or this, this podcast. Um, and hopefully the audio was absolutely okay. Uh, mm, not sure when the next one is and who the next one will be. Don't know what order we're going to do these in, but uh, hopefully you have a lovely day, guys, and uh, chat to you soon.